Welcome back, folks. I'm really excited to be here today. Jay Lamb Bio here. We are going to continue our work through AP Chemistry and talk a little bit about atomic structure, electron configurations, and photoelectron spectroscopy. Now, this is not a video for those of you who have not done electron configurations before. I'm going to go through it relatively briefly. If you need a refresher on that, check my regular Gen Chem video over electron configurations. It'll give you a better idea of what's going on. I'm just going to kind of breeze through it and take a look at how some of the uh, concepts about nuclear shielding apply to different electron configurations, which helps explain things like ionization energy. So we have quite a bit of uh, learning objectives for today. Students will be able to determine the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons in an atom. They should also be able to write electron configurations and interpret the meaning of that information. You should be able to explain Coulomb's law and how it applies to chemistry. Describe nuclear shielding and ionization energy. And lastly, evaluate photoelectron spectroscopy data. So as we all already know, atoms are made of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Now, the atomic number, which is the number on the periodic table, determines the number of protons that are found inside an atom of that element. You also see something called the mass number. The mass number is the number of protons plus neutrons. So do a little bit of algebra, and we can determine the number of neutrons. The number of electrons are the same as the number of protons, unless there is an oxidation number present. If there is, then we need to do a little math in order to determine how many electrons there are. So for example, we have calcium 42. Remember that the mass number can be written with a hyphen out to the side like this, or it can be written as a subscript before the chemical symbol. We take a look at calcium on the periodic table and see that it is 20. Therefore, the number of protons is 20. There's no charge on any of this, so the number of electrons is also 20. Now, with the mass number of 42 and the number of protons being 20, I have 22 neutrons. Pretty simple. Next one down is bromine. Bromine has a mass number, I'm sorry, has an atomic number of 35. So it's going to have 35 protons. The mass number is 80. So we're going to have 45 neutrons. And with electrons, Notice that we have a charge that's associated with us. It is a minus one. That indicates that we have one more electron than proton. So that's going to give you 36. Okay. Now, when you see these numbers, remember, you have to apply that to the number of electrons. Reason being is that if we reduce or change the number of protons, it actually changes the element. So we can't do that. So anytime you see a charge, we have to change the number of electrons. Simple enough. So why are electrons and protons attracted to one another? Why are electrons that are on the outside attracted to the nucleus? And the, uh, that force is actually given by Coulomb's law, which you can see here, where Q1 and Q2 are the magnitude of the charges of the proton and electron, R is the distance between the centers in case is a constant value. Now, I'm not going to ask you to calculate this. I just want you to understand that the attraction or repulsion of charges is based off of Coulomb's law, a positive value is repulsion, while a negative value is attraction. So if you have a positive force, the particles want to push each other away. With a negative value, there is attraction between those particles. So when we talk about electrons, we need to talk about how it's organized on the periodic table. And electrons are organized in a very specific way. Now, it's not going to ask you to find all of the quantum numbers that are associated with electrons, which we talked a little bit about in Chem 1. But you do need to understand how to find electron configurations and how they are organized. Electrons are organized into energy level, subshell, orbital, and spin. Those are the four primary quantum numbers. The energy level is determined by the row on the periodic table. So first row is 1, second row is 2, third row 3. Subshell is determined by the block that they are in, whether it is S, P, D, or F. So the far, two far left-hand columns are your S block. P block is the six far right hand, D block is the middle 10, and the F block are the two rows that are placed below the periodic table. The number of orbitals refers to the orientation of the subshell. So there's only one orientation of S, so therefore it only has one orbital. P, however, has three different orientations, one along the X axis, one along the Y axis, and one along the Z axis. So it has uh, three orbitals, five for D and seven for F. It's actually really easy to determine these numbers because if you remember, each orbital holds two electrons. And so you just determine, look at the width of the block on the periodic table and that helps you determine. For example, the S block is only two columns wide. That means that each part of S can hold two electrons. 
since each orbital holds two electrons, there's only one orientation of the subshell. Same with P. You have six elements wide. P block can hold a maximum of six electrons, so there's three orbitals for that. And then five for D, seven for F. <laughs> Makes sense, right? Good. So I know you guys have done this before, but with electron configurations, you write the energy level, orbital, and number of electrons in that orbital. So for example, if I'm looking at the 1s, I would write 1s2. Okay. Now you continue the process through the periodic table until you've reached the end. So for example, we have chlorine here. Okay. So we have 1s2. So we keep going until we get to that element. So we just follow the periodic table going from left to right. If we get to the end, we then go back down to the next row and start from there. So we have 1s2, 2s2, keep going across, 2p6, down to the bottom, 3s2, and then lastly, 3p1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Just like that. Okay. And there's my electron configuration. Okay. With orbital notation, it's a very, very similar process. We just start at the bottom. We draw out a line for each orbital that's present. Remember, P has three. And if you remember to indicate spin, we write our up and down arrows. So one, two, three, four. Admit. Always write your up arrows before your down arrows. I just committed that sin not too long ago. Okay, but that's how you would do your orbital notation for that. All right? Any questions? Well, it's not like you can reply to me anyways. Let's move on. So just a reminder of a couple rules about electron configurations. Remember that Hund's rule applies here. The lowest energy orbital fills first. So that's basically saying we go in order on the periodic table. The 1s orbital is going to fill up before the 2s orbital. Remember that when you write your orbital notation, single electron in each orbital, then pair up. So we're going to go one, two, three, then four, then five. Okay. The other thing is that if we get to the d orbital, remember that the d orbital energy level is the row minus one. So it's weird because you go from 4s, and then you have the d block over here. It is not. 4d, okay? It starts at 3d. And that has to do with the electron density. Uh, the d orbital is more dense with electrons and therefore has a more attractive charge to the nucleus. So as a result, it pulls those electrons in, uh, meaning that the orbital is actually closer to the third energy level than the fourth energy level, okay? And the same concept for f. The f orbital energy level is the rho minus two. So if we look at the first f block, you would think that it would be 6f, but no, it is 4f. Okay, and again, that has to do with the electron density, pulling those electrons in, making that orbital smaller, and as a result, it is closer to the fourth energy level than the sixth. A couple of other things that we can do with electron configurations. Uh, the first one is noble gas notation. So longer electron configurations can actually be shortened by writing the last past noble gas, which is, <laughs> I love how that rhymes. The last past noble gas in brackets and continue the configuration. So if we look at chlorine, the last noble gas we passed is neon. <laughs> I'm talking about passing gas. I love my job. And then we keep going from there. So after neon, we would write the remainder of the electron configuration, 3s2, 3p, 5. You know, what's nice about this is actually we can determine the number of valence electrons uh, by adding the number of s and p electrons from the noble gas notation. So if we take a look here, we have two electrons here, five here, 2 plus 5 is 7 electrons. So there's 7 valence electrons in chlorine. You can also determine this based on the group of the periodic table as well. Group 1 has 1, group 2 has 2. Skip your transition metals. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Those core electrons that are not part of the S and P on the outside, so all the other electrons are known as core electrons because they're closer to the nucleus, therefore they're closer to the core. Kind of makes sense. A couple of other functions of 
electron configurations, we can determine oxidation numbers, and that refers to the number of electrons gained or lost in correlation to electron configurations. They're often used to satisfy the octet rule. So for example, um, I'll use the term charges probably more often than oxidation numbers, but I just want to make sure you're aware that sometimes those terms are interchangeable. Uh, lithium, for example. Lithium is number three on the periodic table. It's in that first group. It has a plus one charge. The reason for that is that it is likely to lose an electron to satisfy the octet rule. We can see this based off of locations on the periodic table. There's a trend that you can see here. Uh, some electron configurations don't actually follow the rules. So for example, chromium is a little bit weird. You see there that when I write the electron configuration for chromium, there's only one electron in the s orbital, and there are five in the d. Okay? That is just because it is more electronically stable than having two in the s and four in the d shell. Having a half full d shell a lot of times is more electronically stable than having a full S shell. And as a result, you'll see some electron configurations that are a little bit different than probably what you've seen in the past. And then lastly, sometimes an electron will have excess energy to jump to an energy level. So if we have an excited state electron, for example, um, the energy will actually cause that electron to jump up to the next level. When that electron loses that energy, the electron will then jump back down to uh, its ground state. And typically, this releases some form of energy or light. You see here on the right here, we have the standard ground configuration for carbon. Uh, there's energy that is added. And as a result, that second electron in the 2s orbital jumps up to the 2p orbital. Now, when that energy is released, that electron will then go back down to the s orbital. Now, I also want to really quick talk a little bit about ionization energy, because that is the amount of energy required to remove an electron from the ground state. So which atoms do you think would have the highest or lowest ionization energy? Well, think about valence electrons in the octet rule. Things on the far left-hand side of the periodic table have one valence electron in their outermost shell. We know that they want to have eight in their outermost shell. So by losing an electron, they'll actually satisfy the octet rule. So as a result, things on the left-hand side of the periodic table tend to have a weaker ionization energy, meaning that it's easier to remove that electron. And that makes sense because it's going to satisfy the octet rule. Things on the far right-hand side that don't want to lose electrons but gain electrons, or if you're talking about noble gases, already have a full octet, are going to have a very high ionization energy because they do not want their electrons removed. It is more electronically stable to gain one than to lose one, so it requires more energy to remove that electron. Also, keep in mind that ionization energy differs if you're removing more than one electron. Notice that there's a huge jump. And let's take a look at sodium, for example, on that chart. Sodium jumps significantly from the first ionization energy to the second ionization energy. Well, why would that be? Well, think about it. If we remove one electron from sodium, it now has an octet in its outermost shell. It is satisfied. If we remove a second electron, that goes from 8 to 7. It does not want to do that. That is not where it is most stable. And so as a result, the amount of energy required to remove that second electron is significantly higher. And if you look, it's almost 10 times higher. Look at magnesium as an example. Magnesium is in that second column. So it has two valence electrons. So it wants to lose two electrons to satisfy the octet rule. So the first two ionization energies are pretty standard. But that third ionization energy is significantly larger. Reason being is that it has an octet once it loses the first two electrons. And you notice this trend as it goes down the periodic table. This is directly correlated to the number of valence electrons it has and whether it wants to gain or lose them once it gets to the octet rule. And whether it wants to gain or lose them. And once it hits the octet, once it's lost or gained a number of electrons, it's going to be very difficult to remove that electron to take away the octet from the atom. So nuclear attraction and repulsion of electrons helps determine orbital size. We look at what's called nuclear charge. Now, I'm not going to ask you to calculate the nuclear charge of something. But keep in mind that the number, greater number of electrons that are found in an orbital, the closer that orbital is to the nucleus. So it would make sense that the nuclear charge increases from left to right on the periodic table. As a result of this, the electrons are closer to the nucleus as the electron density of the orbital increases. So if we go from left to right, we take a look at take a look at that second row with lithium going to the right. As we increase the number of electrons in that energy level and in those orbitals, the orbitals are pulled closer and closer to the nucleus. So as a result, the radius decreases. The atomic radius increases as we go down the periodic table because as we increase in energy level, the shells of those energy levels gets larger as well. But keep in mind that the radius 
has to deal with nuclear charge. Additionally, ionization energy also has to do with this as well. Think about that lonely lithium electron. Think about that lonely 1s electron that's on lithium. It's just out there in that shell. Because it is so far away from the nucleus, it is much, much easier to just pick off that electron using a small amount of energy. The closer the electrons get to the nucleus, the greater the ionization energy required to remove them from the atom, which explains why things like neon have high ionization energies because they don't want that electron removed. It's very difficult to remove it because it's closer to the nucleus. It explains why ionization energies of group one and group two are relatively low because those electrons are further away from the nucleus requiring less energy to remove them. The last thing I want to talk about briefly is photoelectron spectroscopy and it is a device that provides energy measurement of electrons in atoms and molecules. What's really nice is that the peak represents the removal of electrons and corresponds to electron configuration. So if you take a look at neon, you know, 1s2, 2s2, those peaks are actually relatively the same height. When you get to 2p6, that electron, uh, that peak is roughly three times higher because it contains six electrons versus two. So we can take a look at these graphs and determine the electron configuration. We can determine the element that is present in those graphs. And as a result, we can do some analysis as a result of that. Even take a look at the one at the bottom. You have sodium there. That 3s1 is half the size of 2s2, reason being it only has one electron in that particular orbital. All right, we'll take a look more at this a little bit later on. Guys, there's your student learning objectives. Uh, hopefully we had a good time with this video. I mean, I know I had a good time talking about chemistry. Uh, we'll talk to you guys later. Have a great day. Make sure you like, subscribe, JLAM Bio. Bye.